Welcome to Unify.tv, where truth knows no fear. This is a very special episode I'm bringing you the, um, today with Mr. Victor Avila, um, the author of the book, Agent Under Fire, A Murder and a Manifesto. So this is very special. This is going to be awesome. Um, tune in, watch the whole thing, and make sure you follow Victor on Instagram and on Rump, um, YouTube. And check out all his videos on Rumble. But yes, Mr. Vila, I, I, at first, I really, I have to show you what I have here. Hopefully, you can autograph this one day. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love to do it, man. Yes, I wanted the hardcover, but I got impatient. So I went ahead. And <laughs> well, I, I, have, I have a hardcover here. I have some, so I, you could always get it from me. Oh, you're, you're a lifesaver. I appreciate that. I didn't want to wait that long in the mail, so I need this now. <laughs> I wanted to read it because I got it about a month ago and I wanted to read right. it before I talked to you. Um, but no, I, I truly, honestly, this is very humbling. You have no idea. Uh, ever since I saw you on Scott McKay's show, ever since that day, I had a ton of questions for you. I was like, okay. It, I had a thousand questions in my head of your experience, where you're at now. Was that a spiritual thing for you as well, as far as where you were with Christ or, or were you already connected to Christ? So I had a gang of questions. I was like, what really drew me to you was when I saw you on Newsmax. I saw you on, were you on One American News? I was. I think that's the second place I saw you. And I saw you all, like so many different places. But every time you told your story, you told it with such the energy of like, I'm, I'm still here to help. You didn't have that bravado of, I've done this. I know my stuff. Respect me. You still had it with the same raw intention of helping folks. And that's like, that's what draws me to people like you and Scott that humility, that genuine drive to help people. And that's why I do what I do. And I'm hoping to get to you guys level one day because, I mean, you guys are changing people's lives whether you realize the impact or not. Um, you guys are awesome. Really appreciate my big that, inspiration, biggest inspiration ever. Um, so I really appreciate you giving me any of your time. No, let's but do it. Thank you. The, I definitely want to hear everything you want to tell people who are watching or listening. But I had one specific question for you. Um, well, actually two. When you had that traumatic experience out there, um, and I, I'm not going to make you rerun the whole story because by now people should know who you are. If they don't, they no, can but I'll, check you out. I'll, I'll run and I know you're at a, a time crunch, um, so I don't want to ask you to, to to go longer than you than you have time for. But when you had that experience, were you already connected to Christ, or it, you know how, how did that go that day? Of course, it strengthened your walk, but how strong was it before that? That's an awesome question, Daryl, and one that I don't get asked enough of. Um, and just to remind your, uh, your listeners and your viewers, uh, uh, in 2011, uh, while I was on assignment at the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City as an ICE agent, uh, Special Agent Jaime Zapata and I were ambushed by the Zeta cartel uh, on Highway 57 on assignment as we were driving uh, to pick up some equipment from uh, our other ICE agents of the, out of the Monterey office, and we were ambushed were shot at over a hundred times. Uh, uh, tragically, Special Agent Jaime Zapata lost his life in the line of duty. I miraculously survived being shot three times. And uh, you asked that question. And yes, I, I was already connected to God. I, uh, I grew up uh, as a Catholic. I, I grew up going to church. Uh, I owe uh, a lot of this, all of this to my mom and, and being an active uh, uh, person that, you know, goes to church and not just, you know, Catholic, it says just Catholic for saying it, but I actually was as a teenager was very, very involved in my local church and volunteering at the bazaars and the, all, all the, all the good stuff that, that happens in the community. And so it was the church to me was always part of my life. And as I grew older and I'm not going to tell you that I go to church every Sunday, but I definitely have a faith and I believe in God and I always have. And I believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the power of, of teaching my kids about God. My son, as a matter of fact, just did his confirmation just last week. And so we're very, he's 16 years old, did his confirmation. We want to continue to, as, as children of God, to be the messenger, right? And so the best way to do it is do it with your friends and your family to right. have my kids have uh, God involved in their lives. And so we're a praying family. Um, you, you talk about that day and, and my faith. Um, did it make uh, you mentioned it? Obviously, made it stronger. 
because uh, people ask me how uh, how did you survive that and and there is no answer other than god decided not to take me that day he wanted agent zapata with him that day but not me and so i even knowing that and even being a man of faith i still struggled with that with the survivor's guilt you know uh it, it's an inex- inexplainable sometimes um i just can't explain it and and it's i went through several years of trying to figure out if in fact there was an answer to that question and the, and the real answer is there is no answer the answer is it, it, it's it's an easy one it's actually an easy answer it was there always before me is that it was in the hands of god and god left me here to do probably what i'm doing right now sometimes i say maybe it was as simple as just to see my kids grow up you know my kids were younger then and maybe he just wanted me to be present in their lives and to help raise them and to be with my wife uh, maybe it was as simple as that maybe it was a bigger calling maybe to for me to be able to use my voice to be able to do what i'm doing now and and share uh, not just this experience by my, by my experience about along the border and and all these issues that we're going to continue to talk about today but absolutely uh i talk about this in my book and and my faith and um and and you know i uh i still i still believe that that that's that's the reason why i'm here before you today by the grace of god i believe it. i definitely believe it Something like that doesn't happen. I mean, you've you've heard people getting shot at, but multiple people and then two separate, not separate incidents, but separate moments of the same small time frame. um, That had to be the scariest. I I can't even I can't even picture it when I was reading it. And then I saw a video on YouTube about it and they had the the reenactment of it. I, I couldn't imagine going through that the thoughts that are going through your head and then realizing later you're still breathing. That, that had to be that defining moment. Like, you know what? I am definitely here for a reason and whatever that is, God, I am ready. Cause I'm definitely here for a reason. I should not be, but I'm here for a reason. So um, we all have those moments. Some are less traumatic, but that's I, right. I, I, when I tell you, I'm humbled by the fact that you're talking to me and the, and the fact that, you're doing what you do to the degree that you are still going to the border, knowing the dangers that are there. You eat tremendous respect. I mean, that's, that, that's exactly why I'm always plugging your book, plugging your videos, everything you post, I'm sharing because people should know you way more than what I see posted on my, I follow, I have almost 2,200 conservative P, uh, followers and I'm following about 6,000 and I don't see your stuff as often as I think I should. And it's nothing against you. I'm not, coming down i'm saying that that's a that's a crime in my opinion because <laughs> you are the frontline hero and i'm not even just stroking your ego you are a frontline hero we, anyone can get out there and give intel and tell us what you know intel told them or what they know but you're there all the time you got firsthand trauma and experience and you're still there and to me that that that, that is to be respected i don't know why you didn't get a purple heart but I promise I'm gonna write every letter I can to whomever I can to make I sure you get one. That, not with this administration; they're not gonna appreciate it. But the next one to come, <laughs> I appreciate that. And you know what? Uh, uh, the um, the the title of my book, "Agent Under Fire," it took on a um, it kind of took on a, a different meaning uh, altogether, or an, I should say, an additional meaning because we're under fire in so many aspects of our lives. And you, you touched on something right now. This was my trauma moment about being shot in line of duty, but a lot of people in their own lives go through their own traumatic experience. It could be in your marriage. It could be at your job. It could be at your school. It could be at anywhere that you're under fire and you feel that you're under fire. And so my story, I like to tell people that, uh, uh, the positive a- aspect of it is that yes, you can overcome those situations. Yes, you can lead. Yes, you can come back together. I'm a perfect example of that. It, it was. Let me tell you, there were dark, dark days and dark moments after that PTSD and and the physical wounds and and all these other issues. That uh, if it weren't for my family and my and my and my faith in my God, it would have. Uh, it, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. I, that's plain and simple. I wouldn't be here telling you the story. And because I am, I want to share that to people that are struggling uh, in their jobs, in their personal lives. Is it because of financial matters? Is it because of other issues? 
if you're under fire for all these other issues, you can overcome because if I can overcome what I overcame, I think you can, uh, mine being a very severe one, right? There's a, I always say this in life and in, 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 in living moments, everything has a solution. Yeah. Everything has, in death, when you're gone, you're gone. There's no, there's no solution there, but uh, we have a high rate of uh, law enforcement suicides right now. We have a high rate of student suicides because of the pandemic. We have all these other issues, uh, health issues, mental health issues that continue to happen. And it all ties together with what's going on in our nation with this administration, with the border security, um, the national security issues, the public safety issues, our schools, you name it, it all ties in together because eventually it's going to come to your town. It's going to affect your community and you have to be aware and be prepared. That's what I, that's actually, that perfectly leads, leads into a question. What can we do? The ones who aren't able to go as much on the front line as they like, the ones who are more of the computer people who would just post, 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 bring awareness to it that way. What can we do <clears throat> to be more active in our community and, and protect our own neighborhoods from the small circle that we have or the limited abilities that we have? There's a, there's a lot, a lot that you can do. You know, local, local uh, uh, elections and local uh, communities has, I don't think of any other moment that's been the most important than it is right now. And I'm talking about knowing who your city council member is, who represents you in your town. I'm not talking about Congress. I'm not even talking about your state senator. I'm talking about your representative that represents your street, your community, your neighborhood. Uh, get to know them. They're, you elected them. Right. You need to know what they're thinking. You need to, they need to know what you as their constituent is important to you. You need to let them know, and, and, and it's simple. Um, they are available, believe me. They are available for you to reach out by email. Go to a city council meeting. It's okay. once a month. Uh, you'd be surprised. You would be so surprised what you find out of what's going on in your town by going to a meeting. If it's not a city council in your town, maybe county commissioner, uh, go there because uh, school board is the other one. Oh, my goodness. Go to your school board, please. You'd be surprised what the decisions that they're making that are affecting your kids every day that they go to school or not yeah. go to school, right? They have right now, these elected officials have the utmost power and authority to decide if, in fact, your child will go into a classroom, whether or not you could go into a business, whether or not it's open or closed, mask, no mask. I mean, we're talking about things that affect you every single day in your town around your community. So that's what I ask people is that's the, the number one thing is know who they are, know what they're thinking, because in the border towns, we're very familiar and we might be a little bit more aware of what's going on because we're in Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California. But when you go to New Jersey, all of a sudden you're going to have a group of 300 illegal aliens kids, unaccompanied minors, and they're going to be, have to be absorbed into that school system. Well, what's mm -hmm. going to happen to your child? You, you're a U.S. citizen that has your child in the school. Is your city council and your school board going to favor the decisions that they make favor your child that's a U.S. citizen? Or are they going to favor individuals that have just come in here in this country illegally? Right. Huge question, right? Are they going to, uh, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what I encountered at the border. A lot of these unaccompanied minors, a lot of these family units, they're coming with a lot of issues. Let's put aside the illegal entry. Let's put that aside. They're coming in illegally and the Biden administration is letting them in. Okay, that, that's happening. They're going to end up in your town. And so, but the problem is they're coming with so many issues, not just, they are, a lot of them are illiterate in their own native language, in Spanish, and even their own native language, they speak a dialect. They don't even speak Spanish. So forget English. They right. come, they're coming with a lot of health issues. They've never been vaccinated for anything. Uh, when you grow up in the U.S. 
you know, at two, four, six, eight months, you get your shots, your polio, your this, your mums, and your all these. They don't have any of that in these broken countries. They have, they're bringing the measles. They're bringing lice. They're bringing tuberculosis. They're bringing all these other issues that we haven't seen in a long time here. They will be next to your child in school. This is the importance of an open border policy and the dangers of it because it's not just and that's just the health i'm talking about the healthcare system don't i'm gonna guess if you want me to get started on the on the criminal justice system yeah. let's not even go there because it's gonna bring crime it's gonna bring crime to your city i was watching on the news this morning the surge of crime in our communities in our cities around our country already we have our own issues this is a, the 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 part that I want to hammer home is that uh, these people that are coming from uh, Central America, Mexico, Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, they're coming from broken countries, right? Their, their countries are corrupt. They're, uh, they're violent. They don't have education. There's no work. Well, guess what? We have our own issues in our country as well. We have violent cities. We have crime here, a lot of it. And they come from those broken countries into these communities. And all it's going to do is increase those numbers because a lot of individuals that are coming in are coming in with criminal histories, with gang affiliations. A lot of them have been deported before. There's a, a, lot, of, a, lot, a lot of times a lot of people don't realize that a lot of these people were in the U.S. already convicted of a sex crime, convicted of a violent crime, of a burglary, and they were illegal and they got deported. And guess what? They're, they're taking advantage that the op open borders policy right now. And so they're coming right back. They're prior deports. And yeah. so they're coming right back. MS-13 gang members, Sicarios, uh, hitmen for the cartel. They're going to work for the cartel in New Jersey, in Michigan, in Chicago, in St. Louis, in Maryland, in Baltimore. I could go on and on and on with the list of these cities. And those forces are going to combine and it's going to increase already the numbers of crime that's been surging in the last year. And this is the public safety issue that I'm talking about. Then if you want to shift to the national security issue, mm -hmm. it is the individuals or are the individuals that are not turning themselves into border patrol. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell your listeners a little bit about what I encountered down in the Valley. When I went about a month ago in, in the Rio Grande Valley down in South Texas, McAllen mission, Texas, kind of like the ground zero you, where people have seen the videos of the family units coming in, uh, walking in and turning themselves into Border Patrol. I saw that. And, and that's happening. And in the Rio, Texas, a bunch of Venezuelans coming last month. I mean, last week. I went to El Paso, Texas two weeks ago and Hudspeth County. Completely different. Completely. Uh, I mean, the terrain is different as desert. The Rio Grande doesn't have any water. There's mountainous uh, terrain over there, the desert. And guess what? They're not turning themselves into Border Patrol. They are eluding the Border Patrol as much as they can. They don't want to get caught. Why? Because they're hiding their criminal histories. They're hiding whatever it is, Ill illicit activities or, or criminal backgrounds that they have. They don't want to be caught by the Border Patrol because they won't let them in. They're not turning themselves in like a family unit. Um, they are still using the children, however, and the cartels have said, I'll take the child We'll use the child to gain access for our people and we're going to smuggle you and we'll reunite you. Well, guess what? They're not reuniting them. We have 20,000 plus unaccompanied minors in U.S. custody uh, between Border Patrol and now mostly on health, health and human services, HHS custody in these facilities, military bases and, and um, uh, convention centers around the country. A lot of issues have been going on, uh, and I'll touch on a uh, some of those issues that they've been shutting some of those down because of the issues that are going on in these de makeshift detention facilities. But the point that I'm making here is that there are a lot of bad people coming in, and the cartel are smuggling them. We have, in the national security aspect of it, we have people that are not from Central America. They're not from Mexico. They're from Bangladesh. They're from Somalia. They're from Yemen. They're from Iran. They're from Pakistan. They're from Afghanistan. Doesn't say that they're terrorists, but they come from terrorist 
uh, uh, related or uh, identified countries, which ICE and Homeland Security Investigation refers to uh, special interest countries, or they refer to them as SIAs, special interest aliens. These individuals, guess what, are the ones that might be like the ones the Yemenis that were caught were on the no watch list, on the terrorist watch list. These are dangerous individuals that have a different ideology and want to come into our country to cause us harm. I mean, did we forget about 9-11 already? Right. This is the, the they're, they're gaining access to our country as well. It's not just a migrant, economic migrant that's coming in to want to work here and get free stuff. We have to worry about the ones that are coming in here and taking advantage of the open borders that want to come in here and plan to sell to possibly do uh, causes more harm. And that is an issue that I think need to, needs to be driven home all over the country because they're going everywhere. So how are they, I guess what gets me, I mean, and this is nef- definitely not to their credit at all. I would, I mean, not at all, but how, how did they become so organized with such a system that is not, nothing is really foolproof. Um, but how did they get to the point of being so organized? Uh, I mean, they, they seem to be more organized than some of our local governments. And so yeah. was this done with the help of, and you may not know this firsthand, but was this done on the part of some U.S. assistance? And not to say they can't do this on their own, but it seems like they have strategic everything. Everything is point A, B, C, D. And it's like, it's literally military style organized to where it's like, bam, 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 bam. And That's absolutely is right. this something they perfect on their own? Or do we have some kind of treason going on here? So it's a couple of ways. Um, right now, it's highly, highly sophisticated, highly organized. And so uh, a lot of them, some of the money, and I'll, there's a couple of things here. Some of the money that we are providing to the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, some of the NGOs obviously have the, the right intentions to help some of these individuals because they are victimized at the hands of these criminal organizations. However, a lot of these NGOs are corrupt and they use the money to aid and abet these smuggling ventures. And so you have these smugglers down in uh, that bring the people from Central, uh, from uh, Middle East up through uh, uh, South America, Central America, Peru, all this, all the read the smuggling routes. And then guess what? It's the cartels. And a lot of people think, well, the cartels are only in Mexico. And let me tell you, the cartels in four, are in 40 countries around the world. And wow. these guys know that you're going to come through Mexico. They own Mexico. And you will not be able to come through there unless you come through their blessing, through their permission, and have paid them the, the, your fee. Now, if you're from Central America, you might pay $4,000. But if you're from the Middle East, it's a lot more than that. If you're coming from China, it's a lot more than that. If you're coming from Brazil, everyone has their own fee schedule, if you will. This is how highly organized they are. And so they already have them in the smuggling routes. They're flying people into Mexico City, then busting them in to the border. It used to be where they would travel and come through the, you know, the, 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 Northern, Ter- the, the Northern Triangle there in Central America, and then Guatemala, Mexico. And no, no, now they're just flying directly into Mexico City either you're flying into the border or taking the bus. Why? Because they've already, they're more organized. They're getting them to the border. And then the cartels are deciding at that point, okay, you're a family unit. You go and turn yourself in here. You people are not, we're going to smuggle you. And they continue to smuggle people. They're continuing to smuggle people, what Border Patrol refers to as the gotaways, right? Thousands of gotaways. These are not the people that are counted like last month, there were 178,000 apprehensions. You know, they call them apprehensions, but literally right. it's people turning themselves in to Border Patrol. But the estimate is there was over 35,000, 36,000 gotaways. That's an estimate. We have no idea how many actually got away, meaning gained access into our country without any detection. And we're talking about sex offenders. We're talking about criminals. We're talking about good people. We're talking about bad people. We're talking about anything and everything in between. Terrorists, not terrorists. The, the, the bottom line is the way you avoid 
all this is by securing the border. Right. And, and if you don't secure the border, you will have all these individuals coming in, all the issues that are rippled effect that we're going to see in our country happening because of this. We're six months in, Daryl. We cannot sustain this for the next three and a half years. This no is way. not a sustainable type of policy. We, another thing you ask, what do we do? Let's continue putting pressure on this administration from all levels. You start locally because you local from the county goes to your state rep. Your state rep goes to your congressman or congresswoman that eventually leads to the administration. You need to put pressure on them and say, listen, this is, this is, not, this is not working. Look at the sheriffs around. The, I'm going to be meeting with them next month uh, in Texas. They are overwhelmed. The sheriffs are trying to get together and see what they can do and what kind of authority and jurisdiction they can do because a lot of this that we're talking about is, a, is federal jurisdiction, right? Federal immigration law. Right. Uh, Governor Abbott has done a, a decent job, at least in sending the Texas troopers, the DPS, Department of Public Safety officers down to the border. They're patrolling the river. They're acting like border patrol agents. And they're helping the Border Patrol because guess what? The Border Patrol are so caught up helping everyone else and all processing the kids and all the family units that no, one is, no one's patrolling the border. And so DPS has at least some state laws that they can uh, implement or uh, enforce. For example, they interact with some individuals. If they happen to get a name or date of birth, they'll run them and they have an open warrant. They're wanted in the U.S. They get to detain them. Um, if they have something else, at least they're turning them uh, uh, over to Border Patrol and say, hey, don't let this one in because this one has some criminal history. So at least you can send this one back and don't admit them. This is, th this is at least what they're trying to do. And so it's the, the jurisdiction issue is a big one, um, you know, because you have the federal and you have the state. And so uh, the sheriffs are, are fed up. They are overwhelmed in the communities around the border. And it's going to continue to happen as they move along into the interior of the country. That, that's, that's what I was wondering about. I know they made some kind of announcement about this administration deciding to go ahead and finish the wall. Have they, have they started? No. What you're, what you're referring to is a, is a small, I mean, I think it was 13 miles, basically. When I went down there, and this is down in the valley, you know, they, they abruptly stopped the construction, which, you know, you can't do in any project. You just can't right. stop. Yeah. And that's what they literally did. They, they, they dumped everything, put all the equipment. I saw the, the trucks and the equipment behind these chain link fence locked up. And you just can't do that. They had dismantled the access roads that Border Patrol uses to patrol the, the levee of the river and by the, the wall, well, they had, they had to, you have to finish that. They left, they left the sand just undone, the barricades. And so that's, I think, the part that the, the Biden administration, they got a lot of pressure and said, listen, at least finish that section, which is about a 13 mile stretch of wall that you finish that part, at least, you know, finish that small project. But it's not, it's not, it's not, continuing to build a wall, I think the state of Texas should step up and use our own budget to, to finish our own wall, at least uh, along the Texas border. Uh, and, and see, if, I, I think there, there's something that could be done there because the Biden administration has never, I mean, they never allotted the money even under any, uh, you know, uh, prior administration. So uh, they're not going to do it. They're not going to finish the wall. The wall is a part of a, of a process. I was down there in Hudspeth County a couple of weeks ago. This is east of El Paso, Texas. And I'm, I stood where the, I was talking to an agent. The, the wall ends right there and these huge lights, right? And the lights are turned off. I mean, these lights are awesome. You think, think stadium lights times 100. It, light, it lights up the whole river, the border. It's awesome. But they're turned off. And I'm talking to the agent and I'm telling them, what the heck is going on? He's like, well, when the Biden administration took over, they said, nah, turn them off. Well, what does it have? To, they're already up there. Right. Turn them on. Help the agents, right? You can't see it. It's, it's a, it, I mean, you can't see behind the brush. The, the cartel can literally be pointing guns at the border agents and they wouldn't see them. 
And so he says, well, they don't have the lights on. There's the fiber optic stuff. There's sensors. Uh, you know, we got drones. We got all these other technologies, not just the wall. It's in conjunction with the wall. The wall is not a standalone thing that solves everything. It's a process, right? And right. it's, it's an, an additional tool. But you need the other tools for the wall to be more effective. And if you don't have the other tools, it makes the wall less effective. Right. And so, uh, and I just couldn't believe it. I was standing there, it's pitch dark. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean they turned off the lights? Literally, they turned off the lights. Uh, so that's where we continue to put pressure on this administration and say, listen, at least where you have the technology, why don't we allow our agents to use it to keep them safe? You've heard of the red pill, sure. But what about the green pill? CBD oil continues to drain billions of dollars a year from big pharma and the corrupt medical establishment as patients go back to nature for their quality of life for chronic issues. We have the purest, high quality, full spectrum CBD tinctures at greenpillliving.com. Ask yourself this, do you trust big pharma? Check the description for link. So, okay, so so what, what would happen? I, I, I was listening to what you were saying. You were saying that Texas needs to step up and fund it. What, um, I remember someone just shared a, a post from Candace Owens that she posted, I want to say 2018, 2019, where she said that if every American would donate, I forget how much the money, the, the amount was, she said that America could fund it. So I'm sure by now, most of the wall's been built outside. You said 13 miles that's left. Um, you know, so it's probably a smaller amount that America could donate, but just Texas individually. So how, how would that work, though, when it came down to, because if, if this administration says stop doing it, what leeway does, say, our governor have to say we're not going to stop? You say we're going to stop. We're not, because a lot of these states have been showing independence and saying no vaccine passports, no critical race theory. We're not going to require masks. So it seems like these states are finally finding their legs to say no. How would that work when it comes to this border wall? And how much power does Greg Abbott have to say, you say we're going to stop. I'm not going to allow it to happen. We're going to go. So will it, would it only require funding and then we can keep going? Two things. One, let's, let me talk about the funding first. So the funding, this is, this is the most ridiculous thing when it comes to the funding because we are spending billions of dollars in housing the illegal aliens and, and building facilities. Think about this, what I'm saying. We're spending billions of dollars to allow them in and house them and reunite them with their illegal alien families in our country, yet we won't use that money to build the wall. So we won't even have to do that. It makes no sense. Right. Second of all, it's, it's in, in, in politics and in Washington, it, you quickly realize this. What you call something matters, you know, uh, because as soon as you say the wall, oh, the left gets all, you know, you're racist, blah, 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 right? Right. And, and then they don't want to build it. We're spending, the, 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 we, the, the government, the Biden administration is spending and approving trillions of dollars with a T. They haven't even spent the first ones that I, the, the uh, uh, appropriations that they already passed. And they want two trillion more, and they want four trillion more infrastructure. Which you know, all of a sudden, infrastructure means everything. Um, well, all that money, none of it is allotted to our security, our border security. Not even right. for additional manpower, additional tools. Or the, there's other stuff besides the wall that we need. So the money is already there. If you think about it, the money is already there. It's just that they do not want to allot it for that. They've already, remember when uh, uh, President Trump, I was asking for $5 billion. Now it seems like chump change. Right. He wanted $5 billion for the wall and it was a big stink. They were not going to give you a penny of $5 billion. My goodness, $5 billion is nothing. We would have had it and be done with it. But right. because they hate President Trump, they hate border security, they want to allow these, all these people in that are not vetted. I want to use that word today. We are not vetting these individuals properly. Right. And when you cannot vet people, you cannot vet a person when they're already in the country. And it has to do, and I write about it in my book when it talks about asylum. You know, the remain in Mexico policy and you seek asylum from a country. It was a good policy because guess what? We're checking you while you're over there. Right. Once you're here, there's, 
You're here already. It right. doesn't matter if we check. You already made it. We, we, it was a catch and release. The whole catch and release is back in effect. We right. caught you, but we released you into the country. Oh, we're going to check to see if you qualify for asylum. Well, five years later, when you get your court date, first of all, they're not going to show up. And even if they do show up, guess what? They've already had a child. They've already been working. They have, it's a whole diff, five years later, a whole different story than when they came here illegally. And so it's a big issue for these judges to confront. And it's, it, it's upside down and backwards right now. It's upside down and backwards. But so the funding, that, that's kind of the part of the funding. This is a, what I'll address when it comes to Texas. Texas, absolutely, the governor can say, I'm not allowing any illegal aliens in Texas. Period. Uh, Florida did it. Other states have done it. I'm not allowing you to house any illegal aliens in Texas. As a matter of fact, I am not going to allow any illegal aliens to board airplanes and buses in Texas without an identification to go on to other parts of the, uh, of the country. Right. Absolutely. You know, there's a big issue here. Mm -hmm. We're allowing illegal aliens to board airplanes and buses without identification. When's the last time you did that? You can't. It's called 9-11, remember? Right. We, have, we have redone our airports. We have redone our airplanes. We have redone the cockpit doors. We have done these security checks, these scans, take off your shoes, the liquids, the, oh my <laughs> goodness. And then we've all done it. Yeah. But, you, but as soon as you're illegal, you don't even come through TSA checkpoint. You're right. going gonna to come through the back right. and be allowed to board an airplane without an identification. Yeah. Listen to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. it is, it, it, this is a huge problem. This is against the law. Right. This is the law that we've all been abiding by as a U.S. citizen. But if you're illegal, for some reason, it doesn't apply to them. It doesn't apply to them. And that's right. where Governor, Governor Abbott comes in and says, I will not allow. Get with the FAA. Get with whoever it is you have to get with your senators, Senator Cruz, Senator Cornyn, your Congress people from Texas and say, we're going to push back and say, we're not going to allow people to board airplanes without identification. And, right. and so guess what? You're not, if you can't get on an airplane in Texas, you better go around. You better go somewhere else. We, we, we shouldn't allow Texas to be a springboard for the rest of our uh, country. Yes. We're not going to allow to for the this administration to use texas for all these illegal aliens to gain access to the rest of the country right that's well, what this governor could do and he could do it right now and i don't know why he hasn't and that's what's throwing me off a little bit you know and I, i'm not going to speak on what rumors are going around because rumors can be rumors and I, I don't i've never read into anything negative with him i, I just don't want to acknowledge it but I do wonder what's taking so long to pull the trigger on something like that, because that's not a that's not a waiting game type of topic. It needs it should have been done long ago and it definitely needs to be done now. So I just don't know what the holdup is. It's, it's, it's too late for thinking about it and figuring out why and when. I don't know. Absolutely. It. We're late. Absolutely. We're late. It's way late. And uh, yeah. but but we see other officials doing it. We, we see other governors taking the decisions ahead of time that yeah. they foresee, like you mentioned, the passport the vaccine passports and all that. We see people foreseen saying, well, I'm not going to allow that here. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, just, it's about standing up and leading and being unafraid. Uh, un this, is, this is beyond re-election. This is beyond represent the people and the best for what's good for your citizens of this country and this state. That's the way we're supposed to be governing. Right. Uh, Let's take it back to basics. You're the representative of the people. You're supposed to be making decisions based on what's best for them, not right. what's best for people from other countries. That's yeah. not the way it works. And so everything, uh, everything is flipped. It's almost as if we have, and this is nothing to be racist at all, but it's almost as if we have a foreign president because it's like they're doing more for foreign countries and foreign entities more than the American people. Everything is so backwards. I've never seen is. less patriotism from American people in my life. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I'm, I'm glad you touched on that word because if you couldn't tell already, I'm a patriot and, uh, and I love this country and, and take a look at me. 
I'm a Hispanic American and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the most proudest Americans I am because my parents came here legally and they worked hard. I'm a product of the American dream. I'm a native Texan. Uh, I am what my parents wanted to be, what uh, I want my kids to be. I want them to be successful. I want them to work hard. I want them to have God in their lives. I want them to have uh, a, a successful career. I want them to buy a house. I want them to do and live the American dream and live a beautiful life. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I don't want the 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 government intruding in my life every single moment. That's why I'm for smaller government. Let me make the decision. Let the small businesses make their decision. Help them when they need it, not interfere with them. You know. Right. And so. Uh, it, Yes, the lack of patriotism, the lack, I mean, look at what's happening around our country right now with the anti-Semitic and attacks on Jewish people in yeah. New York. And it's, it's, it's our, ele our U.S. elected officials yeah. siding with, uh, um, with Hamas, with the terrorist organization. This is crazy. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, you're doing a great job in spreading the word. Uh, I, I thank you for having me on and, and, and I'm going to continue to spread the word. And uh, people can follow me if they want to. They can go to agentunderfirebook.com yes. for my book. Uh, shameless plug there. And uh, No, no, and no, no. By all means, <laughs> I, 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 I keep this. Every time I do a video, I, I, I try to flash this <laughs> or talk about it on my page. I'm you telling know, that, you. That, that book is not just about the story. Uh, and you read it. It's, it's in detail. I open myself up. It's very personal. I talk about my family. I talk about my career. Yes, the, the shooting and my assignment in Mexico is very explicit, but I also talk about the solutions uh, about and all the issues that we're facing on our border. And you're going to you're going to go through some emotions when you read this book and you will see and you will uh, from someone that's not just been down there for five minutes and did a photo op. I've worked most of my career there and and have seen a lot and human trafficking. That was my subject matter expertise. And uh, I still care a lot about what's going on with the child trafficking the human trafficking and the exploitation of these children is, is out of control because it's also it benefiting those organizations that continue to do that, by the way. Let's not ignore that. The it's trafficking, cash of, oh my goodness, it is only helping them do yeah. it even easier, you know? Mm -hmm. And so- It's, it's um, quite disgusting. It really is. It really is. And, and so um, thank you. Thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciate it. No problem. I did have one more quick question. Yes. I read this story the other day, and this is not part of the question, but this was what made me think about this. There was a story, and it broke me down. As soon as I read the headline, I didn't even want to read the rest of the story. And this is why, <clears throat> to give you a, and, and, and I know we're crunched for time, but I wanted to tell you, the reason why I do this is because of people like you, because of people like Scott, because of organizations like Deliver Fund and Operation Underground Railroad, and all these places and people, people like Tim Ballard, uh, Jim Caviezel, who are actually saying, no more. All you guys are saying, no more. This has to stop. And I'm going to do everything within my power to make sure it happens. And it's effective. You guys are, I mean, it, I can't even tell you how much it moves me to hear either one of you guys talk or see what these organizations have done. The Operation Underground Railroad was just recognized as the 2021 most charitable, charitable organization. And that's, that's major respect for them. Yeah. And it's like, that's a, that was a quiet, a quiet acknowledgement. That should have been broadcast everywhere. And this is not, it's just like, I read this, this, this story about this child. I don't remember what country it was in. The little girl was eight years old, married to a 40-year-old man. And she died during their sexual encounter. Because, I mean, you, you can imagine why. 40 years old, she's eight. But that physicality was too much for her, and she bled out. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how hard it was for me to get past the first sentence, and, sentence of that. And keep from i mean it's it's i'm trying to hold back now because mm -hmm. there's such such an ugly thing what they're doing i'm trying to hold back it, but it, it's such it, an it is ugly thing. i'll help you out here it's it's horrific um it is i uh I, you know i you can never take those images and those what you've seen out of your your head and i i work these cases i you know i rescued a lot of women a lot of children from these situations in new york atlanta miami houston it is, it is horrifying. I gave, I gave an example there in my book, um, just so people could, you know, uh, it's, it's one of the more graphic ones that I, that I encountered uh, that case in New York, but 
just so people could say, I don't want people to no longer say, well, this doesn't really happen. Really? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, that reaction, Daryl, well, really, does that happen? You know what? Yes, it does. And it happens a lot. And we have uh, millions of people in endangered servitude and sexual exploitation situations. And that's why human trafficking is referred to as modern day slavery, because that's what it is. And they have these uh, men, uh, uh, children, uh, boys and girls, uh, women in these horrific conditions. And yes, it continues to happen. I, I've, I've met with these individuals. I met with uh, Jim Caviezel and them. And, and there's a movie that's going to be coming out, uh, The Sound of Freedom. They're, yes. they're trying to get it out. I've seen, I've, got, I've been privileged to get a couple of uh, uh, the, a screening of it. It's a powerful, it's a powerful film. It's about Tim Ballard and Underground, Underground Railroad, mm-hmm. Operation Underground Railroad. It's a powerful film. I'm telling you, it's the Schindler's List uh, movie of our time. And it, it's very well made. And, it, and I hope it, it's gonna, it'll hit the theaters hopefully later this year or, or early next year. But this is a movie that's going to change, really. When this hits the movie theaters, it's really going to, beyond bring the atten- much needed attention to this to this human trafficking and child trafficking issue that we have in our own country around the world but a lot of it in our own country of of these kids and these women being trafficked not just other ones that are being brought from other countries but but from within u.s yeah. citizens u.s citizens mm-hmm. being trafficked into these situations and so yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I'm big on, on reporting on that and, and trying to educate people and at least to know them, know, tell them that this is something that happens so they could be aware. You know, they refer to, I, I used to do a lot of human trafficking uh, conferences and, uh, and, and uh, teachings about how to identify victims and, and how to conduct human trafficking investigations. By the way, one of the most hardest investigations to conduct and I, I remember, t- you know, this is, this is a crime that happens in plain sight. And yeah. when, pe- when I would tell people, what do you mean it happens in plain sight? Yeah, that victim has been next door. And you have no idea in that apartment that you live. They've had five girls in there for months. And you, you just haven't paid attention. You're not aware. If you're aware, you would n- start seeing the, the signs. And, if, if, you know, if you would look up from your phone once in a while. Yes. If you were, you know. Yes. Uh, be aware a little bit, you would be able to make that call um, mm-hmm. that there's something strange going on. And maybe you rescue five victims from that apartment. Uh, yeah. This is, this is the message that I'm trying to send out that we, uh, as our citizens just have to be aware, be, be aware by being informed in your community. And there's so many ways. I'm not telling you to be paranoid and be a cop. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about mm-hmm. you just paying a little bit of attention more yeah. than you usually, how much did you pay? And maybe a lot of your audience, uh, you know, were born when these are, these things already existed, but <laughs> I remember when they didn't and we had to do other things. And sometimes those other things just meant open your eyes and ears right. and, 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 and look around for a little bit. Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to bring back and say, just, just pause for a moment, look around and see in your own community and you'll be so effective. You'll be so helpful more than you know. It's actually very timely that you said that very, it's actually, it's gotta be a prophecy. It's gotta be God giving me confirmation this morning. It's in the, you, you actually use the exact words that came to mind. Cause you know, they, they have, le, um, uh, legs that start up, started as a campaign, as a hashtag and all these movements that we have now start off as a hashtag. And n- now look what the, the positive ones, look what they're doing. Right. <laughs> so um, it came to me this morning and it was the look up campaign. It lets it already exist. I come with another look name up. and it was the exact reason of what you were talking about. Raising your head up from your phone and paying attention. It was, it was something that was going to teach awareness to children, be aware of, of predators, to right. people in the community, be aware of trafficking. It was literally going to, in my head, the look up campaign. And when you said that, I'm like, that's got to be confirmation. Got to be. Wow. Uh, that's cool. Be. So, that's cool. I mean, I work with you. I work with whoever else. Because because if, if if it's not already done, that would be a hell of a push to get people more aware of what's going on. It could be happening in the apartment next door to me. If I'm not paying attention, right. I'm going to miss an opportunity to get something shut down that should not exist. And that's right. It's too much of this, like you said. And so, um, man, I you are a good guy. I do appreciate you giving me any piece of your time. We're talking about a guy who's <laughs> uh, Fox News regular, 
Newsmax regular, and you give me this regular guy in Bedford, Texas, uh, any bit of your time, you have no idea how much it means to me. And I'm telling you, I will swear, I I could save this video and audio and keep it just for me, and just tell somebody what we talked about. And it'll be just as impactful to me at this moment. I don't have to share this. I'm not doing this to make a name for myself. I'm doing this because you are a good man. People should know you more. And by talking to you is the biggest inspiration ever. And that further drives my movement to do what you're doing. So um, I'm going to reach out to um, Piccolo. I'm going to contact Deliver Fund. And anyone, and all the places you gave me a good list. I'm going to work that entire list. and work with as many people as I can to do as much damage as I can. And, um, I mean, man, you're a good guy. Uh, I do appreciate everything you do, man. Appreciate it so much. Uh, thank you so much for the time today and for the podcast. I'm glad we were able to do it and, uh, we'll, we'll continue to stay in touch. Uh, for sure. yeah, being busy is a good thing right now for me because it just goes to show that there's a lot of people that want that message be said to their communities and I'm like, yeah, I'll talk to you. Yes, I'll come on. Yes, I'll talk about the latest that's happening in the news, the latest that's happening in, in, in the border, on the border. Because all of a sudden, I don't, I don't know if you noticed there, the last couple of weeks, kind of the border kind of went away a little bit. Like, right. eh, eh, mm -hmm. we're done with it. Well, you know what? They, the news, the mainstream media might be done with it, but, but the cartels are not. Right. And the communities are not. They're still the kids, The kids are definitely the not. kids are not. And those are the ones who need us. That's right. And that's absolutely right. The deaths continue to happen. The injuries continue to happen. Uh, a lot of these, a, a lot of factors, a lot of problems, they are even getting worse as we and I speak. So yeah. this is not going away. And I will uh, do as much as I can to continue to, to bring that message. I do appreciate it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much for today.